brought to you by the Every Dollar app. Start budgeting for free today. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, it's the Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual amazing relationships. Dr. John Deloney, number one best-selling author, Ramsey personality, host of the Dr. John Deloney Show, is my co-host today as we answer your questions about your life and your money. It is a free call, and some say the advice is worth exactly what you pay for it. The phone number is 888-825-5225. Thank you for joining us. Kelly in Denver starts this hour. Hi, Kelly. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Uh, Hi, Mr. Ramsey. Um, Thank you for taking my call. Um, My husband and I are debt-free, live in a beautiful place, Grand Junction, Colorado. Uh, About 20 months ago, um, sorry if I'm talking fast, we had to go no contact with his um, very abusive family after I was assaulted. And um, Whoa. Yes. um, Who, Who assaulted you? His mother and his brother. Hit, um, physically we, assaulted you? Yes, they assaulted us when we decided um, we were no longer going to take their abuse. My husband and I moved to Colorado from California 10 years ago to help take care of his mother and father, lived, moved right next door. They gifted us a property of land in exchange for doing that. And two weeks after getting here, we realized we'd made a horrible mistake, but we were kind of stuck. Anyway, back in 1993, um, they set up an irrevocable trust with the three siblings, and um, it came to my home, or to our home, which it wasn't supposed to, and I saw the specs on it and everything, uh, being $300,000 for each child um, when the passing of their parents, that if they lived to be 100, they wouldn't get it. So... um, when all of this horrible stuff happened, my husband even attempted suicide after, I'm sorry, um, after this happened 20 months ago, because we had come here to help take care of them and were treated really badly. Um, anyway, we are worried that the irrevocable trust is no longer available because we know that he was cut out of the will for not allowing his family to um, treat treat him and I badly anymore. And um, are, are you still living next door? Actually, she sold she sold her house. That's pretty much when the the real problem started. She had decided to sell her house after the after my father in law died um, in 2021, um, and she was demanding that we sell our home that we built on this little piece of property next door to them. And when we told her, no, we weren't going to sell it. She wanted to split the the money for, of the house and everything with the other two older siblings. And we said, no, we're not going to do that. And it, it, it Okay. So you still live in the property. She sold the property we, next door. Where did they move to? She moved, she moved in with her other, one of her other children in Lake Havasu, uh, uh, Arizona. Oh, way a good distance away. Yeah, exactly. And we we were granted permanent restraining orders against them as well. And so do you guys have a, you have an income? Do you make a living? Um, we live, we're on retire. We have my husband's retirement and we collect social security as well. And he does, um, how old are you? Handyman work. I'm 66. He's 69. Oh, wow. But we retired at, um, in 2012. Um, so this is like an 80 year old woman attacking you. She actually a 92 year old woman. These people are freaks. Um, well, our new neighbor happens to be a forensic psychologist and he has been so helpful, um, in, Wow. Helping my husband and I get through wow. most of what we've gone through. Um, okay. Um, course, so, so like, okay. So you have a piece of ground. You're 66 years old. You have mm-hmm. Social Security coming in, and you have what else coming mm-hmm. in? And you have a disability. We have a, uh, or, well, he has yes. He he's bipolar has bipolar one disorder, but he never uh, collected disability or anything. He always worked. We owned a business together. No. Do you have he income very, coming very in? Well. Is what I'm trying to get at, honey. Mm-hmm. Okay. You have in you have Social Security um, coming in. What else do you have coming in? 
um, in retirement and his um, handyman work, he makes okay. about eight hundred dollars a month. But yeah. we're we're fine. We're, okay, we good. Do You're very fine. Well, so so yeah. here's my point. Um, it's mm-hmm. not worth it. Well, that's that's why that was what we we had decided. It's we not worth decided it. When we it's not worth it. When we. When could could you possibly them? hold them to an irrevocable trust, depending on how it's worded, what state it was in? I guess you mm-hmm. got a copy of it. You could take it to an attorney and get legal advice. Yep. If you want to do that, you can. Uh, yeah. I, for me, it falls under the heading of life's too short. Um, mm-hmm. Screw it. You're 66. Go on with your life. Oh, my God. Oh, oh, that, exactly. And that's what we've been doing. My, my husband. Except the part where you call me and ask me if you're because <laughs> you're all worried about the trust, that part where you're not going on mm-hmm. with your life. Mm-hmm. That well, that didn't come up until just recently. I and know. my husband, because he lived in a family where money was the manipulation. Yeah, so let, don't let them just forget about it. Don't worry about it. Yeah, walk okay. away. If you okay. get a check in the mail after she passes away, then great. But I okay. would plan my life as though that money's not coming, and I would okay dust my sandals off and go into the next next thing because it's just not worth your soul. Yeah. Yeah, that, and that's what that's what we've what we've been trying to do. And and uh, like I said, we we're debt free. We we have a good life. We have good friends. Yeah, miss our kids like hell. But um, but it's been it's been a it's been an awful awful thing in watching. Where are your, your you kids? Guys the last yeah, your kids? My I've got two sons in California. I've got a daughter in Arizona and a daughter oh, in Texas. You just miss them because of their distance. Yeah, we were extremely close family, and we we left them to come. I know, but I'm saying they're. But you're you didn't you you're you're still connected to them relationally. You just oh, absolutely. They just have to yeah. like most people. They don't live in the same town. With Can you them. sell your sell your place and go be by your kids? You, you, you're speaking as though you're not adults and that you're trapped. That's that was our our original idea was to come here when his parents passed. No, 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 no. Forward, that's all behind. Back, but, Stop all behind. going backwards. But, don't go back. Like today. Don't go exactly. forward. Put the house on, that what you live you in from selling your for house sale. Move to Texas or California. Live near your children. It, it's impossible now because Why? of the cost of well, the cost of living. We are the home that we live in is worth just a little under three or a little over three hundred thousand, and the, if we move back to California where the grandkids are, there's just no way we we don't have the um, we wouldn't be debt free, and we want to we want to live debt free, so we do okay. go see them, so that's okay. not a problem. Okay, so buy um, some airline tickets yeah. and just head over there, and life's good. Yeah, well, I, I really, I mean, you could go, you could, you've got a copy of the trust. You could go get legal advice and, um, and, uh, it depends on how it's worded. Honestly, the weird thing about an irrevocable trust is it may be revocable. Um, it's, uh, depending on who, who's where in the thing, what's, how it's in charge, who's in charge, that kind of stuff. But really, um, it's, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know who put it together. I don't know how it's written I, and without reading it, I wouldn't have a clue. So you could go get legal advice if you want to, but every step you take towards, quote, defending yourself, unquote, uh, puts them all back in your head rent-free again, and I really wouldn't let them back in your head. Think of it this way. Every every conversation you have, every thing you Google trying to figure this out is a choice to be miserable in the present. It's not worth it. Yeah. It's just not worth it. Yeah, no, I wouldn't spend it. Because even if you find out you're completely legally right, you might have to spend a tremendous amount of effort and money to force it. This is The Ramsey Show. Dr. John Deloney, Ramsey personality, is my co-host. Thanks for joining us at 888 825 Daniel is with us. Daniel's in New York City. Hi, Daniel. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Thanks for taking my call. Sure. What's up? So I'm 25 years old. Um, I make 100000 for my W-2 job. I have a couple rentals that I cash flow about $40,000 a year from. Um, I'm thinking about taking a year off from work next year to go get my master's in Europe 
Um, I studied abroad there five years ago when I was in college, and I haven't really stopped thinking about it since. Um, so my question is, is this financially something that would be smart to do, or am I better off basically continuing grinding in my career and working my way up to, to make more money? What's your master's going to be in? It would be an MBA um, with a focus in uh, construction management or project management. Okay. Well, an MBA is an excellent degree. The Europe part sounds like a freaking vacation. Yeah, it sounds like you're looking for an excuse to go spend a year overseas. So that's partly it. I mean, well, you and I'm I both also, know you can get an MBA and keep your job. Yeah, it's it it, it is more for spending time in in Europe. I've always considered maybe moving there like long term. Um, but that's not something I am a hundred percent sure I want to do. And I'm aware that I can make more money here in the States. So it's kind of on the sense, like, I, I don't know if it's smart to, to give up, you know, that hundred thousand dollars I would make that year. No, um, it's not to basically figure this out. No, you're too old for a gap year. You're like okay. a grown man and stuff. Yeah, no, that's yeah, not smart but, at all. Now, if you want to yeah, go to a, Europe and live in Europe and work and get your MBA in Europe and make a hundred thousand there, sure, if that's part of your life plan. But I just want to take a year-long vacation and blame it on education. No. And you, I, I'm going to suggest you're using the wrong wrong metrics for a good life. You keep asking, "Is this smart? Is this smart? Is this good financially?" No, not at all. Doesn't mean it's wrong, but you got to just take, like Dave, you got to right. take ownership of. I want to quit everything and I want to go have a life over there. You're trying to do everything all at right. the same time and make it work, and it's just not going to work like that. You either got to take the jump and go get in the ring and just start swinging, or make peace with your life in New York. So if you got an MBA in construction management and wanted to live in Europe, can you apply that to in a career there? Yes, I just know the salary won't be uh, what I'm making No, here. but if I you want to live there, that's that. what you want to do, right? Right, right. I just, the, the thought of living there sounds good to me. I just, for me, the, the one-year master's thing was a good way to basically test it and make sure, hey, this is something I want to commit to before I do fully move out there and get a job. You don't have anything to gauge it on because you're not actually going to be doing anything. You're you're taking a vacation. So if you go over there and set up life and don't like it, quit and come back. So go spend a year at a new job working and getting your MBA at night like you would normally do when you're 28. And like that's the best pro some of the best MBA programs out there anyway are adult based at MBA programs and, and, and study if you want to study in Europe and work in Europe. And then if you're there a year and a half, two years and you don't like it, quit, move back to the States, apply your MBA. Then that's not dumb, but there's a, there's an element of escapism and childishness to the way you're laying this out that I'm not going to endorse for you. I don't think it's good for you. Yeah. I think you're, I think you're trying to find something that's not there. Or you're trying to be a boxer without getting hit. That's just not how the world works, man. Either go decide right. I want to live in Europe and like they say, what what's going to stop you if you go there and after two years you hate it, you realize it was a bad idea. Just go move back home, right? Come back, come back with your MBA and get back to work doing something else. But but I'm going to go over there on vacation and just kind of not have any responsibility. See, what you have is a, you have a a selective memory about how cool it was when you were there. You forgot all the crappy stuff when you were there before. And so you're, you want to go back to this uh, yeah. unicorn uh, unicorn dust thing again. And no, I, I'm, you know, everybody has this. I mean, you know, Uncle Rico had a selective memory about his high school quarterback days. You know, I mean, no, that was we, for uh, real. Dave. No, he got we all by have we all have selective memories about. No. Nope. And people say, well, the best years of my life were when I was. Oh, crap. No. Uncle Rico got robbed. If coach yeah. had just put him in. Yeah. They would just given him a shot. Give but give me a shot, Coach. But, yeah, but, no, I really, I think I'm just being your older, ugly uncle who tells you stuff, you know, and that's me because I, I love you and I want you to win. I don't – I don't. I wouldn't tell my own son to do what you're doing. Uh, I, I, I would tell my own son to go work. I think he'll find a better choice of life and get a better sampling of what it'll actually be like. You're not sampling what it would be like. 
when you're going over there as a college student. Absolutely. Oh, no. you got to have some skin in the game, man, which yeah. means you got to risk this not working out and me coming home. Yeah, so what? You can get on the – I mean, if you got an MBA in construction management, you can come back to States and make six figures. Yes. You can – in construction management. You can do that. And so um, – and you don't have to live in New York City to do it. Uh, you can live in almost any city, major city in America, and do that. So, and an MBA in construction management, by the way, Daniel, is an excellent field of study. Congratulations. I like that. I like your idea to go get an MBA. There's nothing wrong with that. It's some of the most, I think, John, you can probably, as well, you've got a PhD in higher education. You can comment on this better than I can. But my practical experience tells me that an MBA of all the graduate degrees probably has the best ROI. It's, some of the studies that I, I saw back in the day, and I don't know how new they are, said if you get into an MBA program, go, because it can help. But a lot of those things have circled out and said if you're working while you're in an MBA program, the lessons that you can take from the classroom and apply them that in your current life mm -hmm. is very beneficial. And one of the other benefits of an MBA program is your classmates. And like that one of them is going to go start a business and is going to remember you from class. It becomes an incredible networking opportunity, which suggests to me, if you also, um, in the loneliest generation we've created for ourselves, if you have a group of businessmen and women that you meet with regularly just to see how the world is going and what are you experiencing, how are things going, you might see some of those same benefits outside of an MBA program. But if my son came to me and said, Dad, I'm getting an MBA, I would cheer him all the way, and we'd figure out how to how to make that work. But yeah. it's a versus, great degree. Versus a Ph.D. in left-handed puppetry or German polka history. Yeah, I mean, German polka history's got some legs to it. <laughs> it can. I mean, if you can dance right, man, and and play the accordion at the same time, yeah, it's that, good. And, you know, pat your head and rub your stomach. Yeah. Yeah. Ethan's in New Orleans. Hi, Ethan. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Hey, what's up? I'm uh... – I mean, baby step two, and I'm curious if you would suggest I go into a proverbial stork mode, um, given that I live in a hurricane-prone area, and the deductible, despite having good home insurance, the deductible for my plan in the event of a named hurricane hits is $10,000. So the thought I had was, do I go into stork mode until I have that 10000 saved up well, it's not stork mode. You just do you want to do you want to do a different plan? That's not right. stork mode. Stork modes if you're having a kid. Storks don't bring hurricanes. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I, if I lived there, I wouldn't. What's your household income? Uh, Two hundred thousand. Yeah. Yeah. How much do you owe? I owe about eighty thousand dollars. Yeah. No, no, I, I wouldn't. You make two hundred thousand, you can come up with ten grand very, very quickly in the event of an actual event hitting New Orleans, which averages less than once every ten years. So, um, I mean, the last major one was Katrina, right? Well, I so I, I New Orleans is the closest city. The last one for us was Ida, which was two years ago. Yeah. Okay. Then it's going to be quite a while before you see another one, probably. You got the Weather Channel on, watching Barbados getting hammered, don't you? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. You make two hundred k, you can cover ten grand. You you could figure it out if it, it's it'll it'll work out. You're gonna be all right. <laughs> uh, turn the weather channel off. This is the Ramsey Show. the picture up on our YouTube screen of the cruise we're doing next spring. And the people that are going on this cruise that are friends of ours are so much fun. Manit Shohan, I had dinner with her the other night. We had a friend that had a special dinner and I was invited and she's ended up sitting next to me and she's on the uh, famous chef, celebrity chef on uh, 
Iron Chefs and all, and she's got a bunch of restaurants here in Nashville. She's going to be on the Ramsey Cruise with us next year. That's going to be a blast. Uh, she's a hoot to hang out with. She is. Uh, Stephen Curtis Chapman, world-renowned Christian artist, uh, uh, 60-something Dove Awards, several Grammy Awards, incredible entertainer, incredible talent, incredible man, is a good friend of ours, Sharon's and mine, and he's going to be on the cruise with us. And, um, um, you know, a few other folks that do comedy, a few folks that do uh, illusions and, magi- and, and magic, and, uh, man, it's pretty stinking incredible. Uh, and all the Ramsey personalities are going to be with us. Um, Dina Carter is going to be with us. She's a famous, uh, of course, uh, country music artist, Strawberry Wine. You may remember that song, and uh, so she'll be there. Uh, she's an incredible talent, too. It's going to be a week-long cruise on a world-class, top-of-the-line Holland America cruise ship. We've got the entire ship for Ramsey people. It's the Live Like No One Else cruise. Do not come on this cruise if you are in Baby Step 2 trying to get out of debt. You should not be going on vacation if you're on Baby Step 2 get trying to get out of debt. If you don't have your emergency fund in place. But if you're at Baby Step 4 and beyond, you're investing now you're starting to do some things with your money. You're starting to do a vacations. You're starting to eat out again, and you want to have a milestone event. This is a place you can celebrate. We will spend the week celebrating you. We're going to do events on the ship. All the Ramsey personalities will be doing talks. I'll be on the ship for the entire week. All the Ramsey personalities will. My wife Sharon's going to be with us. We're going to stop at Turks and Caicos, St. Thomas, Puerto Rico, the Bahamas. It's March 22nd through the 29th. There are not that many... Um, suites left not that many rooms left but you can still get a suite still get a room if you get online right now uh, you can put up as little as a 600 hundred dollar deposit and hold the spot again it's march of next year and we'd love to have you the thing will be sold out within probably a month or so something like that the current rate go to ramseysolutions.com slash cruise the live like no one else cruise john that's going to be fun hanging out with our uh, folk i'm gonna have a blast it's gonna be a good time going to be great nicole is with us she's in cincinnati hi nicole welcome to the ramsey show hi thank you so much for taking my call sure what's up so i am getting married in two weeks and i'm very excited yay we're excited for you nicole (laughs) how old are you i'm 31 congratulations that's awesome thank you um so i have no debt other than my home um, and then my fiance has no debt whatsoever. Um, he will be moving into this house with me once we get married here in two weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, he has been backing up cash with the idea of buying his own home, obviously prior to our relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I guess my question is about he's wanting to chunk that cash at the house and pay down the house as quickly as possible. Cool. Um, we're also, I feel like, a bit behind on retirement savings. Mm -hmm. Um, So my question is kind of about that. And for him, he's never been in debt before ever in his life. And so he's a little nervous about marrying into some debt, meaning my home. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So I think that's why he is really focused on that. Y'all are fun. Um, This is cool. What are you you guys going to make as a household once you're married? What's your household income going to be? We each make about 75 a year. Okay, so 100 and a half. And uh, yeah. what do you owe on the house? I owe 188. And how much cash does uh, fiance have stacked? He has about ninety thousand in addition to his emergency fund. Okay, and you have an emergency fund too. I do. Yeah. Okay. Well, we don't need two of them. We'll need one. So, <laughs> True. <laughs> um, so will your will your emergency fund be big enough to suffice for the family emergency fund once you're married? Um, we could probably add a little bit to it. I okay. have about 15 so how much right is, now. So you have how much? 15. Okay. And how much does he time. have? He has about 20, I believe. Okay. All right. So easily we throw a hundred at the 188. Agreed? Okay. Versus like catching up on some retirement savings? No, we don't do any retirement. You're going to put 15% of your household income into retirement. If you're not doing that, get okay. that set up after you're married. Automatically no. going, going into 401ks and Roth IRAs, no more. Yeah. That's enough. Yeah. That's plenty. Okay. You're only even 31. Though, you're only 31, 30, and you're okay. going to get the house paid off very quickly, and then you're going to kick up. And as soon as the house is paid off, you can put more than 15% in. But you're not behind. You're fine. Okay. Okay. How after? So after chunking his money at the house, how aggressive should we be? I think 
he is a little um, more on the anxious side, more conservative side, and he wants to kind of act like we're in baby step two and like really pay down this house in like a year and a half mm-hmm. um, versus I'm I'm thinking it would be okay if we took a little longer than that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what are your thoughts? Probably right between you two. Okay. We, we don't tell folks to be uh, gazelle intense in baby steps four, five, and six. We tell you to be intentional. And so that mm-hmm. means in, in one, two, and three, you're not on vacation. You're not going out to eat. That's intense. No lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Lifestyle is scorched earth. No life. You're getting out of debt. Right. You're not there. You're at baby steps four, five, and six, and you're intentional, which means you're going to want to do some other things. You may need to upgrade a car. You may actually want to go on a vacation. You may want to spend mm-hmm. some of your money on fun, and you should. Okay. Okay. So it's but okay let's let's just, just let's just throw it. Let's throw out a couple numbers here. Okay. You make one fifty. Okay. If you put a hundred, you said you had one eighty eight on the mortgage. Mm-hmm. Okay. So if you put a hundred on it, that's eighty eight. Forty four out of one fifty would be done in two years. Mm-hmm. And that means you guys would be living on over a hundred thousand a year. That would give you plenty of room for other stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That also means you have a paid-off house at the age of 33. <laughs> that's true. You that's know who else has true. that? Nobody in America. <laughs> yeah. I never expected that because, you know, me, you know, prior to getting married, I never was on that track. Well, so. you both you both <laughs> have been you both have been very conservative and wise. Neither one of you have got a complete mess. You're both in good shape. You've done a great job, yeah. both of you, and now you're talking about this ahead of time. That's a good sign. Yeah. It's a good sign for your relationship. Yeah, I, it's a good sign for your probability of building wealth. And so if you put it on a two to a three year schedule to finish off the other eighty eight, throw a hundred at it, that should give you okay. plenty of wiggle room to have a good life. Okay. So just fifteen to retirement. We don't need to do extra to catch up there no. and then the rest of our extra money, quote unquote, can go towards the house. Right. If you put fifteen percent of hundred and fifty thousand dollars so twenty two five towards retirement, and that's all you ever do from thirty one to sixty five you'll have about ten million dollars okay, so that, you're fine that's a lot you're fine okay you, you're you're gonna be worth a lot of money with the track you're on if you continue to be intentional and um I appreciate his nervousness because it's moving you towards positive things, but we don't want to let it go too far. Here's what's gonna help him because I have that same bent that I want to treat a mortgage like baby step two also put a plan down on a piece of paper and y'all agree on that plan. So he wants it done in a year and a half and you are like, ah, three or four years will be fine. Say two years or two, you know, or two and a half or 26 months. I don't care. Put it it down down. and then he'll exhale and go, okay, now I've got something I can work towards. And it keeps that tornado from just cycling up. Oh, and I would also agree as a part of that little, uh, we will go out pink, once a week. We, well, I'll say no as a pinky swear and spit shake. Okay. With our current numbers, we're going to put a hundred on it and lay it out. But if we got like a found bonus or a, uh, you know, granny passes away, leaves them $10,000, any extra found money we're throwing and we could speed the schedule up on paying off the house. I like that. But also yeah. you get to say, we're going to have some fun and go on a date because we're newlyweds. Yeah. yeah. And go, we're going to go on a go vacation. On vacation buy, yeah. up, upgrade that junkie butt car you're driving. I don't know. It's okay. As long as you're paying cash for all of it and you got the wiggle room to do it and you know and it fits in your plan. So I don't care if it's twenty six or twenty eight or twenty four months, somewhere in there. You're that's intentional, that's not intense. And that's a great band name, Junkie Butt Car. James, note that. <laughs> oh brother. We have a battle of the bands here at Ramsey and they always get their names from weird things I say on the air. This is the Ramsey Show. Dr. John Deloney, Ramsey personality, PhD in counseling, number one best-selling author. He's my co-host today. 
Open phones at 888-825-5225. Thanks for joining us, guys. Our question of the day comes from Jen in Tennessee. All right, Jen writes, I came to this country years ago with nothing. I've worked hard, don't have any debt. My house is paid off. That's just, just stop there. That's so great. And I'm investing. Growing up with nothing and being so hungry and so poor created a scarcity mindset even now that I'm in a place where I have all the necessities that I need. Sometimes it's hard to wrap my mind around it, and it's hard to not feel guilty sometimes. I would love to hear your wisdom and advice about how I can develop a spirit of contentment. Mm -hmm. Whew. I have grown up my whole life in the States, Dave, but I identify with this. Okay. Like just that sense of feeling guilty sometimes, mm -hmm. feeling like, why me? Like like that sense of uh, something's not right, mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. tough, man. How have you wrapped your head around that all these years? Um. Well, I th I think this ninety percent of solving a problem is realizing there is one. So she's identified that that she should not have this, but how do I? So how do I not? You know, I I feel discontent, and I should be in a place where I'm content. I feel guilty, and I don't know. Don't I didn't do anything wrong? So what am I guilty of? There's nothing to be charged with here. You didn't do anything. There's not a crime committed. Uh, you didn't. You didn't wrong anyone. No one got hurt. You uh, didn't steal your way into this position. You worked your way into this position. So, um, you know the the uh, the thing. The only thing I've ever been able to come up with is um, that that has helped me a lot uh, is uh, I balance my. Um, consumption with my generosity yep me too if i increase if i feel a tinge of i don't feel worthy to be here which i don't that's why i tell people i'm better than i deserve um i'm really smart and i work really really hard but the blessings in my life are beyond my smarter hard work <laughs> okay You're right i mean it would just be it would not that's not humility and that's not false spiritual pride or something it's not a humble brag it's just simply an uh, an intellectual observation that I'm I, I have a life that is beyond my smart or work ethic. I got good smart, I got good work ethic, but my life is beyond it. Okay, Correct. so I'm better than I deserve. Those of us that are Christians, we call that the blessings of the Lord. Okay, which is beyond what I did. I I played my part, but it's beyond what I did, and so you can say I'm better than I deserve. And that's like people say, you ought to be positive and say you deserve it. I I, I but it wouldn't be accurate. I am better than I deserve. And I'm also, it's a statement of grace, doctrinally, I'm better than I deserve because I deserve hell, and I'm not going because of Jesus. Okay, so all that stuff. But the aside from that, the the when I, I Sharon and I are able, I remember the first time I tithed, because I give a tenth of my income to my church, the first time I ever made $100,000, and I gave a $10,000 check. I was like, Oh my God, that's so much money in one lick. I mean, one time I, I, I like wanted to kind of announce it, you know, like this is going in the plate, boys and girls, look at me. This is happening. 10 freaking thousand dollars. You know I mean? It kind of went, all that stuff went through my head, but, um, but it's just a normal rhythm of our life. So we automatically did it, but it was still like, wow, that just happened. And, uh, and I've continued to have those feelings with, um, that, that now we're able to give more than we used to make, you know, a lot more a than lot we more. used to make in a given year, you know. And so uh, and gener so generosity helps me go, okay, it's part of the rhythm of my life, and it helps me to not, quote, unquote, feel guilty. I don't ever really feel guilty. I've not had that issue. Um, uh, but I do have the sense of I'm not I'm, – I've gotten more than I deserve. But I don't feel guilty. Guilt is not the word for me. It's just um, unearned hmm. blessings. Uh, that's different than guilt. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, the word that I hang on it that has stuck with me and that has been very helpful is practicing. So Jen, Jen was yeah, yeah, surviving yeah. her whole life, yeah. and now she gets to practice giving. She gets to practice enjoying. Godliness with contentment right. is great gain. And so if you've never done it before, so if Jen was asked to start learning a new language or Jen was asked to start doing gymnastics, she would stumble and fall and 
yeah. hurt hurt herself and yeah. sprained an ankle. It's part of it. Same as giving. Same as contentment. Um, contentment. Yeah. So when I I remember, um, I felt so guilty a couple of years ago buying a guitar. I just it, it sat on me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I went and found somebody to give a silly amount of money to, like to donate toward a thing, as not a way to offset it, but as a way to practice. Okay, I feel this, and then mm-hmm. I'm going to not just stew on this and not be dramatic, but I'm going to be extra generous, and that's been a way to balance it for me. You know, when I practiced that, I can remember precisely the first time I practiced that. That's interesting. Because I was driving a Mercedes that had 260,000 miles on it, and it looked nice, but it was a piece of crap. It was completely used up. And um, uh, a guy that was working for me at the time, uh, I was probably worth a couple million dollars, something like that. A guy was working for me at the time. Uh, was in the car. We jumped in the car, and we were driving to Chattanooga from Nashville, which is a couple hours south of Nashville. And um, stupid thing overheated. And so I'm off the side of the road at the dadgum truck stop rummaging through the dumpster trying to find a bottle to get, you know, a, a, to get some water and pour over the radiator because I'm a redneck. I know how to fix the stupid car and keep it going, right? I'll, I know how to get the thing cooled off, and I'm going to get it on down to Chattanooga. And this guy working for me is a friend of mine. He's just ragging me to no end. You freaking cheapskate. You've got millions of dollars and we're here on the side of the road because you're too dead gum prideful to buy a decent car because you're afraid of what somebody will think about you having a nice car. Ooh, gotcha. Totally got me. It owned me because that's exactly right. I was, I had reverse pride. I was like, I don't have to, I can drive whatever I want to drive. Well, I was driving a piece of crap. And, uh, and I was afraid that somebody would think it since I'm on the radio telling people sell their car, you know, that I shouldn't be driving a nice car. And I had, it made me process through the philosophy that she's dealing with here. And when I got home, I went and bought a two year old Jag, um, uh, which was a great car. And I drove that car for a while. It was, a, it was the ones that back when Ford was making Jags, they were good cars. And, um, I don't know, they may still be making them. I don't know, but it was a, it was a great car like, I, uh, in the nineties. And so anyway. That was a while back, a long time, a couple decades ago. And then fast forward, I went the other way up in 2014. I got a bunch of criticism for having a nice house. Some guy decided he was going to go bananas on the Internet, and it pissed me off, these left-wingers, communists, telling you you can't succeed in America and you should be ashamed of success. And I went the other way, and I went and bought three cars. You showed them, Dave. (laughs) You showed them. (laughs) I drove one of them today. It's a 2014. (laughs) So, but, uh, you know, so you could kind of, you could, but so it's like I, th- I think the moral here is saying it out loud and then practicing your way through the emotions and not letting other people set the tone. Right. It's not about other people. It's about what's right between you and God. Are you being proper towards your family, towards your community, towards your future and mean being responsible with that? Have you done anything wrong? Are you morally out of whack somewhere with what you're, how you're gaining the money? Probably not. Um, but then there's always some moron out there that's going to be envious or jealous that those dirt on your the Jen's success. Whatever side you're, yeah, you're doing. It could be your family. Yeah, it could be something else. You know, like you know, like we say, you're getting above your raise and all that stuff. But anyway, you just say, look, you. It's between you, your brain, your conscience, and God. And if you can get that straight. And that's a matter of practicing, adding generosity to the equation, intentional generosity that's, that grows as your income and your wealth grows so that the generosity is not back at your old income level or your old wealth level. And your enjoyment grows as your wealth grows as well. And uh, your, your use of money for personal consumption, the quality of your vacation, the quality of your dining out should go up as you go along but not so much so that it's out of whack. All of that fits into this contentment issue. It's a great discussion, Jen. It's a great question. And I think the, the, the meta thing here is it's okay to feel weird anytime you're doing or experiencing something that you're not used to. That's yep. okay. You're not crazy. Not something wrong with you. Matter of fact, you'd be something wrong with you if you didn't feel weird. Right. So just make sure you practice. Practice your way through it. That's good. Good word, John. This is The Ramsey Show.
Jordan kicks us off in St. Louis, Missouri. Jordan, welcome to the show. I don't have the show here. Let me flip back. There we go. Jordan, are you with us? Yes. Yes, thank you for taking my call. Yes, how can Rachel and I help? Hey, just wondering if you guys had any tips on staying forward thinking in terms of saving and doing everything, you know, the way I should do it, but also being able to stay present and enjoy the moment. Interesting. So what's question. what's the pain point there? Are you you're budgeting right now currently and you feel like you're not yeah. able to enjoy it? Well, not necessarily. It's just I feel like, you know, saving and everything is much more geared towards the future. Um, But I don't want to stay. I want to be able to enjoy the moment um, and enjoy the present, but also be able to um, secure the future. So that can be reflected in your budget. Do you have things in your budget that involve spending and vacations and buying things that you want to buy? So I think it's more of just a general mindset thing than like budget specific. So it's like, it's, it's, it's hard for me to shift gears from like future, future, future to enjoy the present. Yeah. And I think that there's a time and a place for all that, that thinking and, and dreaming. I mean, I, I'm probably more like you, Jordan. I probably enjoy the present easier than I do thinking about the future. So I just know with my personality, then I'm like, okay, I have to set time to make sure that I'm looking at future goals, but I don't do that every day. I mean, Winston and I, my husband and I will, you know, we have, we call it dream uh, dream dinners. I don't know how cheesy that is. I like it. it. That's nice. might be a little cheesy, but we'll just go to dinner and be like, Hey, if money wasn't an option, what would we do? And like some dinners, we like take the conversation down to what if we would lived in Montana on a ranch and we're like off the grid, like it's that to buying a new car. I mean, whatever it is, but it's like, you just let yourself dream. And then out of that, you really see, okay, where do I want my future to go? And then, yeah, then you kind of set money aside to get there and to hit that goal. But, but I'm not sitting there every day thinking, Oh, what am I going to be when I'm 50? Oh gosh. Oh gosh. Oh gosh. Do you know what I'm saying? So I, I, I feel like I do enjoy the moment while having goals for the future. Uh, but I think there's a level of probably contentment, Jordan, too, of the present of just being excited and happy where you are. Um, And then when the time comes that you carve out specific intentional time to really think about the future, then you're able to be in that mindset. But I think you can turn that mindset off and you don't have to live in that in a daily basis. Does that make sense? Does that help? Yeah, absolutely. I I mean, that's that's great advice. I I do think I kind of get stuck in that mindset sometimes and it produces a lot of anxiety. So I appreciate that. What helped me, Jordan, was having a good, healthy mix of short-term and long-term goals. So an example, me and my wife, we want to go to Europe later this year. That's a short-term goal we want to save up for. We also know we want to save up to buy an upgrade in house later down the road. That could be a few years from now. But we also have things that are happening this weekend that are in the budget that we're saving up for. And so I think having that mix makes you feel like I'm not just thinking about the future. Yeah, and it helps when you're doing the thing for the weekend that you're present in the moment in the weekend and you're like, hey, we planned on going out to a nice dinner with friends. So when you're enjoying your nice dinner – you actually enjoy the dinner and thinking about the moment. You're not thinking, oh, gosh, yeah. I got to fund my 401k to make sure I have this amount of money. You know what I mean? Don't let yourself go there. Because I do think, Jordan, to your point, that can be unhealthy. And it steals the joy of the moment that you're in if you're constantly just thinking about the future and the past. Like, I know people that live in the past. Oh, yeah. And it's the either the regret or the, oh, those were great years if we could just go. Right? And there's a time and a place to go back. But I think that there's a healthy mentality to be in the present and to enjoy it. So I think you're on the right track, Jordan. Um, I think it's a great question. Are you married, Jordan? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm single. I'm 28 years old. Okay. What I would do if I'm if I'm in your shoes, I'm going to find some friends that I think are wise and that I want to hang out with and go kind of dream a little bit with them and use them as accountability and use them as kind of that bounce bouncing launch pad to go, hey, let's have some fun. I want to budget for some things in the short term. I want to budget for some things in the long term. Maybe they'll give you some ideas of what that could look like. Yeah. All right. I hope that helps. Thanks, Jordan. Yeah, appreciate the call, man. You know, it'd be an interesting. I'm just doing this on the fly. If it works, it works. It's Friday. It's all live. Okay. If, if you, there are single people out there, call in because I do want to have a discussion about this quote unquote like accountability partner. So Ooh. I say that because we talk about that a lot at Ramsey. If and you're I, not married. And I kind of hate that word. Can I say that too? Yeah, accountability feels <sighs> icky. I don't know. I agree. It feels like old youth group of like, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, so find a friend that you like. And the idea, and the reason we say this is because you don't need to do life alone. And when you're single, 
you know, every, it's isolating. all of your decisions are up to you. Everything from buying groceries to making sure the oil's fixed in the car. If you have a car that has oil, fellow Tesla owner there. Wow. Right just, there. Yeah. Right there. Uh-huh. Don't leave me hanging. Uh-huh. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> but but what I'm saying is like, you're not, <laughs> sorry, George, the, the decision making, you're, you're making it in a vacuum in so many areas of life. So having a person that walks beside you. Um, to bounce, those, especially those big decisions with, yeah. is really important. When you're starting out budgeting, having someone that's wise with money to be like, hey, I just want you to look at this and make sure I'm not missing anything crazy. And it's a very organic, natural conversation. I feel like sometimes it can sound so you robotic. You don't walk up to someone and go, will you be my accountability <laughs> partner? And see my budget every single month. Can we meet on the 15th at 3 o'clock so oh, you gosh. can see don't my every month budget? But, but I do. If you're single out there and you have this person in your life and it's working well, I want you to call in because I want to talk about it. Because yes. I think there's a really great way to do it um that is very helpful and is possible but it's not um overly form you know that it's not just like awkward or something wow well there it is Is rachel just opened up a singles theme hour so give us a call triple eight eight two five five two two five let's talk about this is good because too i'm gonna keep adding on here because i got married young so winston is all i mean i've I've had a husband for a the, basically my whole adult life yeah so when i talk about it i know friends that have done it and you know and i have a friend and she's great at having someone in her corner um but i always like to hear real life how this works for people day in and day out and what it really looks like tactically so but for you did you ever have a good friend that that was that before oh yeah because there's there's friends that have been mentors to me that i look up to a lot and of did people you really that show here. them your budget yeah, we talked to you know the ins yes. and outs of money, especially in a place like this at Ramsey. Right. It's unless they're making fun of how you know screwed they are with their student loans and sure. you know car payments.